What inspired you to found the Diplomacy Training Program as an NGO in 1989? And what influences in your life, the circumstances and the motivation and hope did you have at that time? Well, uh, the founding of the Diplomacy Training Program happened uh, more or less around the same time as the collapse of the Berlin Wall, the end of the Cold War. And um, uh, that meant the traditional um, blockages uh, in the United Nations, in the human rights system, like in the Human Rights Commission in Geneva, between uh, the Soviet Union, China, and the Warsaw Pact countries, and the European countries, the US, uh, would be uh, disappearing or diminish. There will be more common cause on the promotion of human rights. Well, we were mistaken, but uh, uh, at least it uh, we draw, uh, took away uh, one of the old arguments uh, in uh, blocking uh, progress on human rights, and that was the threat of communism uh, that led to uh, so many uh, tensions and conflicts around the world and uh, made the UN uh, paralyze often. Uh, my uh, experience in lobbying uh, the international community in regard to Timor-Leste to gain uh, support taught me that uh, you cannot just simply understand, read, study, get a master's degree in uh, human rights, humanitarian law, and then you will succeed. That is only part of uh, your academic uh, studies. You have to understand the complexities and nuances of international politics, of diplomacy, the powers uh, that play uh, with each other, the games nations play, uh, national interests versus principles, principles and the pragmatism. You have to understand the dynamics in the world, in each country, the forces at play, besides the state, you have civil society, media, churches, NGOs. So all of this, a multitude of uh, possibilities, complexities, difficulties, but all possibilities. And uh, I learned on the job in New York by instinct, by doing, and uh, then uh, I decided I should, in part, share this experience, knowledge with others uh, who didn't have it to go through the many, many years of learning on my own as I did. That's why DTP was formed, to share experience, knowledge with other human rights advocates, human rights defenders, particularly from the region Asia-Pacific that was less represented internationally in the human rights front. There were many activists, uh, very effective human rights lobbies from Latin America, from Chile, Argentina, uh, South Africa at the time of the fight against apartheid. Uh, the worst at the time throughout the Cold War period, the 80s, 90s, was the Asia-Pacific region. Particularly the fate of indigenous peoples were completely ignored in the UN human rights system. So the diplomacy training program, a pioneer in this field, was this a new idea? Had this existed before? Or what made you think this would work? Well, it, it didn't exist before. Um, I was familiar with it. I did human rights training in uh, France, in Strasbourg, in New York over the years, uh, formal uh, human rights education. But you sit there, you listen to an academic, talk about the United Nations Charter, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the treaty bodies. You can end up writing a master's essay on that. Um, but it's not just that. The knowledge is important, but uh, equally important is to understand uh, the dynamics of international diplomacy, uh, using media, network, building network of civil society, arming yourself with a lot of patience, skills to cultivate, uh, build networks, to lobby diplomats, politicians like in US Congress, European Parliament, 
because the fight for human rights, for democracy, for justice is not uh, black and white, is not so simple. You have uh, to be smart, you, you have to have convictions, obviously, that's number one requisite, but having principles is not enough if you want to succeed. If you're leading, you have to be wise, smart as well. How were you involved in the diplomacy training program from the beginning till today as its founder and patron? I was at actively involved in the beginning, uh, but then as the demands of my own time with Timor-Leste intensified, I became less and less involved, but by then there were, it was set up, consolidated, highly uh, committed people, board members, uh, instructors with different uh, experience they share as uh, lecturers, as conveners throughout these 25 years. So uh, a diplomacy training program uh, uh, is on its own, autonomous and gain uh, roots and uh, it remains unique in the region, it remains unique in the world. I still know about the human rights education programs all over. There are master's degrees, and so what? You get a master's degree in human rights, and then what you do with it? You go to university and you lecture. <laughs> and, uh, and I wish you good luck uh, with that. But uh, the promotion of human rights, protection, struggle of human rights, it's more than uh, understanding the laws, uh, the treaties. You have, uh, like in any struggle, you have uh, to know how to move the pieces in a chess game. You, uh, you have to be, uh, out, to outsmart the adversary, or you have to win over the adversary, uh, make them uh, feel that uh, the struggle for human rights, it is also in their interest. So it means you should not look at everybody as enemy. Uh, the governments are government. They elected some, others are not elected. Uh, if there are ways and means in a country, in a society, to have a dialogue to promote human rights, do it. If you need to mobilize international support, to put pressure, do it. But you have to know how to do it, to be effective. Have your expectations been made after 25 years of existence this year? It has made a, a, a difference, not huge. It will be uh, probably uh, not realistic to say that it has made huge difference. The United Nations has it made huge difference in the lives of many people. The powerful Security Council has the Secretary General made uh, life different uh, for many. In some ways, yes. In many ways, not. So DTP has contributed uh, a bit. If it just uh, created hopes, and that hope uh, give uh, incentive to people to continue to persevere, uh, to uh, achieve the goals of justice, of freedom, that is already a contribution. If all of us contribute in some ways, we can achieve the wildest dreams, the most impossible dreams. What are the greatest attributes and achievements of the diplomacy training program? It is uh, based on uh, the understanding uh, of uh, sympathy, solidarity with people. I conceived it to help promote in the cause of human rights and justice for those who are neglected, forgotten, disfranchised. I don't promote through armed struggle. I don't promote through violence. Diplomacy training program is precisely a substitute for violence, for hatred, for despair. That there is a slim hope that through peaceful means you can achieve what you want, democracy, justice, human rights, freedom. What can you be most proud of? I uh, don't know what I can be proud of. I can just be satisfied, happy that I have done a bit to uh, give back to the world, give back to the people what I gain from so many others 
who supported me over the years in my lonely struggle in New York, in Geneva, in Brussels, in so many capitals around the world. What new challenges does the diplomacy training program face in the 21st century? Fundraising, you cannot uh, work without uh, money. Uh, you cannot shake a tree and uh, the leaves that fall turn into money. So it has always been very difficult for uh, us to raise money. And uh, raising money is not to pay huge administrative costs. DTP has only two or three full-time uh, personnel. It's to help participants from poor uh, regions of the world to travel uh, to where the DTP is held, to pay uh, their meals, uh, their accommodation during the two, three weeks that the course is held. In what way is the diplomacy training program still a pioneer today regarding other NGOs and human rights institutions? I don't know. Each of us are different, have a different task. Some are purely academic, as I mentioned before. I know most of them. Uh, DTP is the only one, and remains the only one, that has a combination of uh, academic, theoretical knowledge, but also uh, practical skills in how to uh, mobilize uh, support resources to achieve those principles, those goals. How can the diplomacy training program grow even more? Which of your goals still needs to be fulfilled and how? It will continue, hopefully, resources permitting, as long as there is a need uh, to uh, help people in Asia, uh, indigenous peoples, minorities, or people in general struggling for democracy, to trust the international community, the United Nations system, to trust uh, uh, in the possibility uh, of change through peaceful means. Should diplomacy training be included in the general education of children and how? And what will be the message for the children? I wouldn't say uh, this diplomacy training program, a curriculum designed for adults, how to lobby governments, media, uh, should be included in a curriculum for uh, children, but uh, other principles, principles of human rights, of solidarity, of compassion, of mutual help, should be there, not only the school curriculum, but should be at home. Parents uh, should educate their children about uh, loving other children, uh, about being generous, about not being selfish, about not to always wanting a, a new iPhone, a new gadget, uh, new shoes, new clothing, but uh, they should show uh, compassion and uh, you educate your children at home, not just in schools. If at home they are not educated, what they might learn in the school, and assuming the school is a high quality one with human uh, humanity values, uh, might be uh, killed, neutralized, negated at home where there is no appropriate ambience, atmosphere for them. You have just been invested as a companion of the Order of Australia. What was your first reaction and how do you feel about this award from Australia? I'm very um, touched, uh, but what I did is what uh, was my obligation as foreign minister of my country, later prime minister, president, uh, still as a leading citizen in my country, my obligation is to help promoting the best possible relationship with people to people, government to government, between Timor-Leste and uh, Australia, Timor-Leste and Indonesia, Timor-Leste and Japan, China, any country that we can think of but particularly Australia and Indonesia being our two uh, closest neighbors. Thank you very much for your time, You're for this welcome. interview. And um, hopefully we'll do this uh, documentary by the end of the year. And you will know about this as well. God Thank bless you. you. And we'll go to interview Abel as well.
Thank you. Thank you.